It's U of L today on 93.9 The Ville. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. This is the show that's about all things University of Louisville. So if you're a supporter of U of L, like U of L, alumni of U of L supporter of UofL, listen to the show. You might learn something over the next 30 minutes or so. So on the show today, he's won a prestigious international scholarship to study music overseas. He's an interesting guy and a very talented guy, and we'll talk with Mitchell scholar James May. And how do memory and thinking go together? If you've got a good memory, does that mean you're smart or not? A UofL researcher will be here to talk about her studies on memory and intelligence. But first, guns, gun violence, and gun control are a hot topic right now following the school shootings in Florida. While the focus is on guns that can fire dozens of rounds too quickly, making mass killings the norm in this country, the truth is that two out of three gunshot deaths in this country each year are suicides. Steve Lippman, Bilal Abade, and Simrat Sarai are all with the UofL School of Medicine. They've been doing research on guns in the home and suicides. Welcome to all of you. Good to see you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Glad you're all here. All right. Steve's been on the show before. Bilal and and, uh, Simrat, you are grad students or what are you? You're medical school. Yes. Yes. uh, We are done with the graduation from our home country and we are here doing the research in the infectious disease department at the University of Louisville. And uh, we are doing this research project with our Dr. Lipman, and we are here today. <laughs> okay, where are you from? Yeah, I'm from India. Both of you? I'm from Pakistan. Pakistan, okay. Yeah. Well, welcome to uh, the United States, and hope you're having a good time with Steve <laughs> over here at the University right. of Louisville. Thank you yes, very much. Thank you. All right, so you've done some studying on guns in the home and suicides. Right. Uh, tell me what the study involved, and we'll go from there. Well, actually, um, the suicide is the leading uh, cause of death in America under the, uh, under, the, uh, under the age of 40 years. And of all the suicides, um, over, over more than half are related to the guns. And in America, approximately 60 people take their lives each day due to suicides. And 20 veteran, military veterans kill themselves, take their lives due to the due to gun-related suicides. So you can see it's a, it's a big public health issue these days. And um, according to the CDC, in 2013, uh, 2013 there, are 30, there were 33,000 uh, gun-related, uh, gun-related uh, deaths, mm-hmm. and out of which more than two, uh, more than half were related to the suicides. It's about two out of three, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So about 20,000 or so of the gun deaths in America yeah. um, are related to, are the, related to the suicides. To the, to the right. suicide. Of course, that still means there's 10,000 killing themselves by homicide. Yes. Right. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, and... Um, So here I want to stress the point that the mere presence of a gun in the home puts you at an increased risk of a suicide. And it has been found that uh, the the homes which have uh, gun access, uh, they they are more prone to kill themselves. So it was a survey conducted uh, in Washington, D.C. in 2008 um, where there were uh, over 400 gun-related deaths, out of which 84% were related to the suicide and 11% were due to the homicides, and 3% were uh, the accidental deaths. Even though the guns are bought to protect uh, themselves, you know, to protect themselves from the intruders, we are actually putting ourselves more at risk of suicide and more at, more at risk of homicide. And you can just see the numbers just tell you. So, yeah. so Bilal, let me ask you this. Uh, your, your numbers, uh, we, we, there were right. a lot of numbers thrown at us there, but... Um, the studies that you all did, did you all just compile the statistics from around the United States and from the CDC to put together your research, or did you go out and start an entirely new research project on your own on suicide deaths? Actually, recently we we did this review article on the guns and suicide, and we compiled all the data we have from uh, from the previous studies, and we compiled the data, and we found our numbers, and they are huge. And uh, if you see, the CDC is not uh, much, and uh, they are not very encouraged to pull up these numbers. Well, that's because Congress mm-hmm. doesn't want them to have those numbers, <laughs> okay. right? So this is one of the reasons that the last CDC number we found was from 2013, the last actual number. So, I mean, uh, this is one of the considerations we will uh, talk about it, that we have to encourage, uh, we have to make laws that the CDC, uh, the, that body should also give up, give some numbers to the public and we can go with those numbers. But yeah, we, we, we reviewed all the articles, we reviewed all the studies which have been done, and uh, we, we did this review article on that. We also got some of the stuff, some of the numbers from the Kentucky Violent Death Recording System. Uh, there is a Kentucky Violent Death Recording System that puts down cause of death of every violent death in Kentucky each year, each day. 
And what did you find in Kentucky, Steve? Well, exactly. It, our our numbers are slightly, s- slightly higher suicide rates uh, than the national average, but basically we're pretty much in the same ballpark. Okay. We're talking with Steve Lipman, who's a professor in the School of Medicine, and also Bilal Abade and Simrat Sarai, who are um, here in the United States at the U of L School of Medicine. And they did a study on gun violence and suicides and the prevalence of suicides uh, using guns that were found in the home. So, so what, it, what do we tell folks? I mean, what do you, I mean, you just said, Simrat, that if you've got a gun in your home, right. you're more likely to commit a suicide. Right. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Because uh, uh, most of the suicides uh, occur because the person is really impulsive. You know, they are very indecisive uh, about the decision to kill themselves. They are going through an emotional turmoil. They have, they have, uh, they're going through a breakup. They are going, they have legal difficulties, or they are, they're depressed. They are suicidal. So, it has been found that uh, it's a very short duration where a person um, actually makes a decision to kill themselves. It's in 24 percent of cases, uh, it's been found the uh, the decision the person makes is uh, less than five minutes, and in 70 percent of cases, it's less than an hour. So it's so a snap it, decision. Yeah, yeah, it's very, and, and 90% of people who survive from suicides, they actually regret, you know, uh, making this decision. So uh, so you can see how, how imperative is this time frame. If they have an access to the guns, you know, they'll just, they'll just grab and then kill themselves. So it's how important it is to prevent uh, the access of guns from the people who ha- who are going through an emotional turmoil in in their life? So, so, um, so, so we should we as a physician and we uh, we want to stress this to the public that uh, even though we buy guns for our own protection, we are actually putting ourselves in that increased risk. Bilal, what do you say to folks that that? I mean, a lot of folks in America, as you well know, yeah. since you're now in this country, yeah. own guns, as you said, Simra, for their for their own protection or for mm-hmm. hunting or whatever, mm-hmm. keep them in the home. Right. So what would you suggest uh, that you can cut down the suicide rate in the United States if we wanted to? Yeah, suicide is one of the things, I mean, only we can do is prevention. I mean, after suicide, we cannot do anything. So it starts with prevention, and it's the whole uh, remedy is prevention. So the biggest prevention is if we have to have the gun, we should keep the gun unloaded, and in a safe place, and uh, and in a separate place, not in the bedrooms, not under the beds, and uh, always we should always keep think that the gun is loaded, and we should never point a gun towards anyone. Well, that's what you tell kids all yeah. the time. Right. But do you think adults aren't smart enough to figure that out? I mean, this is the, we have a big number. I mean, if if we see in emergency departments, you ask the patient, and he says, "Oh, it happened. It happened by accident." I just shot accidentally. So it is a big number of people who are just sh- uh, shooting them by accidentally mm-hmm. because they didn't know that it's loaded or unloaded. And on the other hand, as uh, Simrat also said, the depressed patient, patient who have any suicide I- ideation, patients who are uh, abuse, uh, abusers, like drug abusers, patients who are going through any turmoil, any legal difficulties, they should be addressed. And they should, I mean, we should, the doctor or whoever is the first point of contact, they should tell them that you should keep away yourself from the guns. And if you have any gun in the home, keep them in a locked, safe place and unload it. This is the biggest suggestion, uh, recommendation, which I will. Well, well, you two come from India and Pakistan. You come from foreign countries that do not have, that that have much stricter uh, gun laws than we have in the United States. Do you, did you walk into the United States and think, this is crazy that everybody owns a gun? Yeah, yes, I mean, that is, yeah. <laughs> one day right. I came to the Louisville and I saw big uh, signboards and say, here's a gun show and uh, you can walk in and anyone can walk in and buy any stuff he wants. And I was like, wow, I mean, uh, it looks like our countries are at higher risk, but the, it's so public here. Anyone can buy a gun. And uh, I mean, it was it's so easy to have a gun here. And then anyone can go through any distressed situation. I mean, we all go through some depression in some t- point in life. So if you have a gun in your pocket and you're depressed, and as Simrit said, it's just like five minutes of a decision, and you take your take your take yeah. your life. Simrat, I want to ask you a question. We got to wrap up here in just a minute. Mm-hmm. But right. are women more likely to commit suicide than men? I've heard that. Is that true? Uh, yes. Or not? It's actually women are more prone to the uh, homicides related to the gun, gun, gunshots, and they're more prone to the suicide as well. But uh, if you look at the stats, you know, uh, white males, white, white American males are more prone to suicides. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I've, I've heard that. Uh, uh, that thing might be if you have a gun at home, yeah. 
then your family members are 12 times more risk of suicidal. So if let's suppose I have a gun at home, then my wife is at 12 times more risk to attempt a suicide because she will use the or the or the children will use the gun of the one of the family members. So that is the one reason. Maybe I am not suicidal, but I don't know about the family. So they will use the same gun. And so that is one of the recommendation here of smart guns. Smart guns means only the owner, only the authorized owner can use that gun. So this is one of and the things. And there's technology out right. there yeah. that your fingerprint right. can only, or yeah. The, yeah. is it a thumbprint or something, can only yeah. be used to pull the trigger. Yeah. So this is one of the things which is coming up, but still they are encouraging to have guns, but they are putting some new technology to make it safer. Right. And I think the key statistic there was you're, what, 12 times more likely to, to get have a suicide, suicide. or a, 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 yeah. in, in a house family than, member than right. if yeah. you don't have a gun in the house. Right. Wow. Yeah. That's a big number. Yes. Big. All right. Well, good luck to both of you in your future studies and Thank doing you. your residencies wherever they are. Thank, Thank you. you. Steve, thanks for being on the program again. I appreciate it. I know you Thank didn't you. contribute much. You got great students here. <laughs> That's, That's what you. the purpose is. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. much. Thank you both. James May is a graduate student at the University of Louisville School of Music, but he's headed off to someplace far away here in a couple of months. He's won a George Mitchell scholarship, and James is here to tell us what that means and how his Irish background may have played a role in his ability to win this prize. So, James, good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you, too. Thanks I, for having me. I, I should tell everybody we've already done a story, a, a video story on James and his uh, Mitchell scholarship wins, so we really enjoyed listening to you play a little music and <laughs> chat with us a little bit. All right, well, tell us a little bit about James May, first off. Sure. Um, so I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I did my undergrad degrees in music and in English at the College of Worcester in Northeast Ohio. Um, and now I'm finishing my master's in music composition here, just barreling through my thesis on uh, this last semester. <laughs> barreling? Yeah. <laughs> and so how are you doing here at UofL? Good. I, I've had a, a really fantastic time here. Um, the School of Music is really wonderful, and the city is really wonderful, too. I've, I've really enjoyed my year and a half here. Yeah, that's what a lot of people say is once they get here to Louisville that the, that the city and the university are basically one, and it's a, it's a wonderful uh, social and academic experience here. So yeah, be it's been really fantastic. All right. Mitchell Scholarship. Yep. What is that? Uh, so um, I think the scholarship coordinator, Pat Condon, likes to compare it to the Rhodes Scholarship. So the Mitchell... Uh, funds study for a year in Ireland for um, 12 American students and it's an annual scholarship it's very very highly competitive uh, it's just it's set up by the US Ireland Alliance so it's sort of meant to foster relationships um, especially academic relationships between uh, you know students working in America students working in Ireland giving people in America the chance to have a year to really experience what it's like to live there so you're one of 10 Americans that won one this of, award. One of 12. One of 12, yeah. I'm sorry. One of 12 Americans who won this award this year. Congratulations thank, again. Thank you very that, much. That's awesome. So do they pay for everything for you to go over to Ireland and study music? Yeah, pretty pretty much. Um, it's it's really remarkable. It's kind of, it almost doesn't make sense. But yeah, <laughs> they pay for, for travel, for housing, for my tuition, and I have a, a stipend to, to live on for that year. So it's it's really an exceptional opportunity. And how did your background, you think, play into your ability to win this award? <laughs> um, well, I think that, you know, I I think, first of all, it made me really motivated to apply for it. I wanted to have the time to actually live where my grandparents grew up rather than just visit, which I, I'd sort of done in the past. Um, but But I was just so captivated by the idea of actually studying there and experiencing that culture. Um, and I think that it also helps that the committee knew that I knew what I was gonna get into, um, that I had so some experience with you know, Ireland as a country and that I wouldn't be in over my head. They didn't want me to freak out the first time I had a, a hamburger and it didn't <laughs> taste like McDonald's. <laughs> Talk with, talking with James May, who's a, a graduate student, a master's student at the University of Louisville in the School of Music. What are you studying right now in the School of Music? Yeah, I'm studying music composition. Okay, and your music composition, as I know, is not uh, the traditional classical music composition. Yeah, it's not not quite uh, Beethoven. How would you no. describe it? Um, so it's it's interesting because in a lot of ways what I'm writing is still coming from the tradition that people associate with classical music, big concert halls, big orchestras, stuff like that. Um, but in the 20th century, basically, a lot of the styles that composers were interested in 
just hugely diversified um the same way that a lot of music diversified in the 20th century i mean thinking to 1900 and 2000 how many new genres of music existed in the latter um so now what i'm writing is i'm still sort of writing in that tradition so i'm writing for ensembles that are made of violins and violas and trumpets and and woodwinds and percussion and stuff like that but i think the style of it is a bit more it's pulling from a lot of different places um i have I grew up listening to a lot of like punk rock and alternative rock. And um, so sometimes it's really obvious (laughs) that I listen to that music in my classical compositions. Sometimes it's not. But I think there's just now a mentality about writing what you're interested in um, and sort of just making it work within that realm of instruments. How is going to Ireland going to help you become a better composer? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. So the the program I'm doing at the University of Cork is really unique in that it's in it's very interested in sort of experimental music and new types of performance media and stuff like that. So I think on one side it's just going to be an incredible opportunity to experience some pretty weird and really exciting music that um people in certain realms of classical composition are doing. Mm-hmm. Well, I would call it non-traditional music. From, yeah. From what I, we heard, uh, when we I came over that, to visit, is that, a, is that a fair assessment? I would probably say that's a fair <laughs> assessment. And at the University of Cork, you're going to be living in a dorm? You're going to be living in a house? house? I'm actually, I'm not sure. I'm excited. You don't know find, yet, do you? I'm excited <laughs> to find out. Can't wait to figure out where you're staying, right? Yeah, that'll be nice. <laughs> and, and how does that work? Does the Mitchell Scholarship folks, do they help you find uh, lodging? And, and yeah, so I think as I understand it, um, there's a... Uh, Uh, It really is done through the university, and the university does a lot of assisting in that realm. I don't know if that means I'll be in a dorm or if they have some sort of uh, apartment or, you know, condo complex for grad students. Like you said, you'll figure it out when you get there, right? Yeah, you know. (laughs) All right. Again, we're talking with James May, who's a Mitchell Scholar winner from the University of Louisville. What have you learned at the University of Louisville that you hope will carry you in to your career and and over to Ireland for this Mitchell Scholarship? Yeah, so um, I think that uh, one of the most important things that I've experienced at UofL is that you sort of have to, you you get in what you, or you get out what you get in, what you put put in. in. Let me say that correctly. I got it. (laughs) Um, You get out what you put in. But so UofL has so much opportunity and the school of music is so supportive of contemporary music that... Um, you know, as a grad student composer, there's any time I wanted to do something, it was sort of just, well, you can do that if you so choose to make it happen. And I think that um, with the resources at U of L, I was able to do that in a really successful way. And I think that that is, uh, I mean, it's just such a valuable skill. And so many doors have opened for me, even ju- even just here because of the work I've done in that realm already. Um, so I, th- I think probably more than anything that just go-getter mentality. Very good. All right, well, James May, you're an extremely talented young man. Oh, thank good you. Good luck in Ireland. Congratulations again on the Mitchell Scholarship. We're very proud of you at the University of Louisville. So I'm 58 years old. I'm losing some of my memory. I can't remember people's names and some other things, but I, I can't, you know, from time to time that happens. But is it affecting my ability to solve problems and think critically? I would say yes. Marcy DeCaro is an associate professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences, and I'm here to find out what she will say. Marcy, (laughs) welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. All right. right. You've done some research on this whole idea of uh, does memory uh, affect or impact your critical thinking and your ability to solve problems? What was the study, and what did you find? Okay. So let me start by saying... um, you know, to defining what kind of memory I'm I'm talking about. So what you're talking about is more long-term memory. So your ability to remember things over long periods of time, like people's names. Mm -hmm. So I specifically have looked at working memory. Working memory is more like short-term memory. It's your ability to remember things for like 30 to 60 seconds. Oh, I can do that. Yeah, right. And so, and it's your ability to do that, not only remember it, but to also work with it. So you can kind of manipulate math problems, for example. Um, And also importantly, it's your ability to kind of keep away kind of distracting or interfering thoughts. So so your ability to work with sh- temporary information at a short period of time is actually 
what we're showing negatively related to your ability to solve insight problems or to show kind of innovative or creative thought. But there's a lot of nuances to this. So that's kind of okay. the big picture point. But um, but it depends on kind of a number of factors. All right, we can talk about those. But, it, but in essence, I think what you're saying is your research has found that people uh, that have good short-term memories and, and memory, what? what? What do you call working it? The, memory. The working memory. Working yes. memory. Um, are not the best problem solvers. Well, is that fair or not? Mm, okay, no. Not that simple. <laughs> not that. Not the best at... It's okay. What they, <laughs> what they tend to do is they tend to overthink problems. So uh, they're good at your typical like problems that you would see on an intelligence test or a math test or you know and other things too, reading, comprehension, that sort of thing. So people with higher working memory is actually correlated with intelligence, so you would expect a whole lot of positive things with working memory. But what but what they're not as good at is kind of letting go of complex solutions and and engaging in more kind of innovative or creative thinking. And so it, it actually the research shows that, you know, your brain kind of has these two different tracks. So you have like the reasoning, problem solving, like the the high working memory track where you're you're using your frontal lobe and you're thinking through a problem step by step in a very kind of concrete way. But your brain also has this more like associative processing that it does, where it's kind of bigger picture. It's putting together loose connections that you're not necessarily thinking clearly or explicitly about, but that your your brain is still working on it. And, and by letting go of kind of this frontal lobe, this working memory, this explicit type of thinking, um, you're more likely to engage in this more like distributed or associative creative type of thought. And so they kind of compete with each other. I gotcha. And so, so it really does, it's not an intelligence thing. Right. It, it doesn't have anything to do with intelligence. No, it has to do with letting go when you need to. Okay. So being kind of more flexible or adaptive when you, you need to do that. And a lot of times people with higher working memory appear to, based on our data, um, they stick with like trying the, the things the hard way and then not letting go and just letting a simpler kind of idea or a shortcut strategy. All right, and we're talking again with Marcy DeCaro, who's an associate professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at the University of Louisville. Uh, and we're talking about memory, basically, is what we're talking about, and being able to solve problems. So what would you tell folks who, who say, um, you know what, I, I, I just don't understand all this stuff, and all, all, all she's trying to tell me is that my working memory isn't very good, or it is good, and it's either going to help me or it's going to hurt me. Is it is it that simple? No. Or, uh, what would you tell them? It's never that simple, right? <laughs> of course it's not. We're so, talking about your brain, right, so it's never exactly, simple, right? Exactly. So what, what, the one nice thing that I think comes from this research is that it's not only the people who have the high intelligence, the high working memory, that can do innovative creative thought. So I think that's one important thing to remember that we kind of have a diversity in the way we think. And so people who have lower working memory have can capitalize on that. They can capitalize on the fact that they can make associations often better and um, and will use that when the time is right. Um, Are they more creative, potentially? Potentially, yes. Yeah, and there's some research. I mean, again, you have to have both. You have to have the ability to put the problem features into your brain in the first place. But if you have the ability to do that, then oftentimes, and that and that kind of that goes with common stereotypes too. You know, the ADHD and so on. Like you often are tend to be more creative. Mm -hmm. um, is the stereotype, but again, it's not as simple as that. Um, and so, you know, what do we do with that information? Well, I think the most important thing is to remember that, um, you know, you need to put yourself in a situation where you're going to kind of match what you need to be doing. Like, so if you're supposed to be kind of pushing through and solving a problem and you know that you have all the things you need, then do it, use your working memory, kind of focus on it, don't let yourself get distracted. But if you need to think outside the box, you know that you keep hitting a wall, you can't kind of get to that point, um, then it's good to get put yourself in a situation where you're not going to allow yourself to think. And so we actually have interesting research showing, for example, so my collaborators on this project, um, Charles Van Stockham is my graduate student, and Marika Veet. Um, Marika did a study where she showed that if you solve problems at your non-optimal time of day, so like if you're a morning person and you solve problems at night or vice versa, um, you're actually better at showing insight. So, really? Yeah, your non-optimal well, time of day. Uh, exactly. that doesn't make sense. To me, that's... And it's not intuitive. Exactly, which is what's so neat about it, because that's the time of day when your working memory is lower. And so, you know, it, and you might, I mean, maybe you've, you've kind of thought about that. So at night, maybe if you're a morning person at night, like these are when kind of the new ideas for what you're going to do the next day or, or some problems that you kind of couldn't. I mean, oftentimes you kind of anecdotally see that to be true, I think. Um, 
or we've shown, for example, in our research that um, people who are ego depleted, which means basically your brain is worn out. Um, <laughs> so like we have and people, that every day for every American. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> exactly. Well, typically that's a bad thing, right? You it, you lose kind of self control. Like that's when you're more likely to eat potato chips all night and, <laughs> and so on. But it's it's also the time when you're more creative is what our research has shown that people are actually more likely to show good you know, insight, problem solving, and that sort of situation. So put yourself in that kind of situation. Oh, they even showed this with a alcohol, like mild alcohol drinking. Um, people are better at insight problems if really? they're drinking a little. All right, so go booze it up, folks, if you're trying to <laughs> solve some problems, right? Is that just what you're trying to say? In moderate, moderately, yes. Okay, well, how about marijuana? Does that help or not? I, you know, I don't think anyone's researched that. <laughs> no one's Maybe researched that's, that. that's your study that, that you can that's do. That's the next study. <laughs> you also talked in your research about the aha moment. Yes. What is an aha moment, and what, it, what does it mean in terms of your brain research? Okay, so so that is the aha, aha moment is the moment that you gain insight. So, and that's the special thing about insight problems, is that it's not a typical math problem that you chug through and get a solution. It's a problem that you kind of you keep, like I said before, keep hitting a wall. I you they call it like a mental set or a mental rut that you're in. A mental block. Yeah, exactly. And um, the aha moment comes when you finally make that novel connection that you didn't think about before. Um, the, oh yeah. Yes, exactly. Like the Eureka moment. You remember that mm -hmm. story? Like um, it's that's what it is. So it's it's a special like again insight where you know you've got the problem answered and, and it's different than a typical math problem because it comes suddenly you don't see it coming and suddenly it's it's here and, and you have that aha moment so so tips for people who may or may not have a lot of working memory but are trying to uh, do some problem solving what would what would you suggest they do step away from things don't overthink things what are some of the right. tips you have for these people so people who don't have as, as high mm -hmm. working memory I would say try to put yourself in a situation where you can put the relevant problem information into your mind um, so people with lower working memory have a harder time inhibiting distractions so they're actually better at the creative process part but they're not as good at the the part where you have to like figure out what I need to do to solve this problem mm -hmm. so um, so put yourself in a situation where you can try to avoid distractions. Um, one, some of my other research has shown, for example, like if you're doing a math problem, like talk out loud while you solve the math problem. It helps you focus um, because, you know, speaking about the cognitive. I do that, by the way. Yeah, it, it's actually good. It helps you focus. And, and, you know, the research behind it says that it's because you're putting this information into your working memory and you're keeping it there by like focusing on it by saying it out loud instead of letting your kind of mind wander as you do it. So. I, know, I know this is a little bit different topic and probably for another day but has anybody looked at what the impact of smartphones and electronic devices have had on people's ability to um, lock in on a problem and solve it and not be distracted because my son claims he can do like 15 different things at one time. He can do his homework, yes. listen to music, watch TV, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, that's funny. That So that's not this r r area of research at all that's relevant because it's right. all about multitasking and distraction. Right. And what they show is that people think they can do it well. But when you actually put them in the lab and have them do a multitasking task, the, the people don't yeah. do it as well as they think. So it, indeed, it's, it's, a, it's a problem that people can't calibrate what and that's I think the overarching issue here people don't always know when they are using their working memory or they're, they're focusing their attention properly versus right. not very interesting stuff Marcy to Carol maybe I need to have you back on to talk about the electronic devices and how, <laughs> sure. how, how they blow us away all right thanks for listening to L today with Mark Hebert and go cards